Welcome to Mach 1 Games. I'm Rich Mayo, and today I'd like to talk to you about something I call the Rule of Three. And this Rule of Three can apply to many different types of role-playing games, and is just a shorthand for giving the moderator an understanding of what scope they can use for arranging things in the game. So the rule of three is very simple. I find it distasteful to reduce a role-playing game to a single resolution or a single role for something that is interesting to the players. And that's what this rule of three is all about. Trying to, at a minimum, give yourself three roles to resolve something. Now, it's not just three roles for the sake of making roles. It's for the sake of letting the players engage and adjust what their strategy is, if it's working or not working, and it gives them feedback on their approach. So let me take any type of task that you might undertake. Let's suppose it's searching a room or doing a heist or playing a game of chess or um, freeing some uh, children uh, from a prison. In any of those cases, we have a task. And what I challenge the moderator to think about is think about maybe expressing this, doing your planning, thinking about three things. And the first th three things is to think of things as having a beginning, a middle, and an end. Let's unpack that a little bit. So let's say that we want to engage in a game of chess. We want to, number one, ensure that the players experience it as a beginning, a middle, and an end game. And in chess, that's called an opening, a middle game, and an end game. And so it fits very nicely into this paradigm, but you're going to see a lot of things do. So now that we've got this idea that we've broken it into three zones, well, what makes those zones different? How can we uh, make those things feel like they're each their own type of challenge? Well, now is where we um, talk about another sort of group of three. Is there uh, a person, a secret, or a tool that we can think about in relation to each one of the beginning, the middle, and the end? So if I think, well, maybe there's a secret uh, that I want to have, where would I want to put this secret? Or maybe there's a person. Where would I put that person? Or uh, they, there's, a, there's a tool or a trick. So uh, even in our very basic uh, chess game, and this is not scripted, this is just sort of off the top of my head, I could suggest that you remember as you're going into the opening that uh, you'd been reading a book on this and there's this there's this clever opening trap you don't remember exactly um, all the permutations of it but you think it might give you an opportunity therefore you're letting your players make a choice so it's not enough just to break things into three you have to have each section feel a little different, and you have to have something there, something that distinguishes it. So we're not just going to have our players make roles. That's a, that's a lazy dungeon master, and I know that there's some secrets of the lazy dungeon master, um, but I've, I've got my own sort of secrets, my own way uh, of doing these things. So first off, Make sure that you break things into three and then you give people an opportunity to have these different sections feel different. You could uh, have them, their first opponent is really strong at openings and so you need to be able to hang on for that, etc, etc. Et you see where I'm going about th this. 
The other thing that I get to with my threes is there's actually three levels on which things work. There's a mechanistic level that's going to appear to your appeal to your gamist type players. There's a story element which is going to appear to the uh, appeal to those people who are invested in the story as it's playing out. And then there's emotional. Uh, the emotional world of the of the role player. So then you start to think about, okay, how can I put something tactical in for the tactical person? How can I put something uh, emotional in for the role player? And how can I connect it to the story for the story focused player? And so again, you think, okay, there's my three worlds. I have a beginning, a middle, and an end. I've got these different types of things that I can insert and then I have uh, the types of people that I could be appealing to so that I'm not always just doing the same thing and my games don't feel like rote. Now we can expand on this so the chess game may be interesting but in order to link your whole campaign together what you want to do is you want to have a before, a during, and an after. And that's the same thing as beginning, middle, and end. But it's very, there's a subtle difference because before the chess game, well, what tricks can you do? What uh, Maybe you're going to hire somebody to make noise outside of this really strong player's um, uh, thing at night or maybe you're going to give him something to make him sick or, or maybe that happens to you maybe there's some story or drama that's unfolding before the game happens and so you might have a secret a person or a tool that's in the opening and you can have a clue to it and the clue could be a mechanical clue for the gamist a story clue for the story person and a role-playing clue for the role-playing. Oh, this guy is so powerful. Uh, he's only lost one game um, in the last year. Well, that's something that the players could seize upon. They might sink their teeth into and go, oh, who's that one player? Let's go talk to him. Let's see what happened. Why did he lose? Or they could ignore it. And this is the key thing. Your players, if you've got a good structure like this, where you're throwing out a beginning, a middle, and an end, and you're giving a before, a during, and an after, players can then in ch can choose how interested they are in this thing, in this world. So you're going to offer them a buffet, but some people don't like nuts. Some people don't like cheese. You give them these things and see who picks up on them and then see who enjoys the reward and they'll come back for them once they realize hey i like the taste of cheese i like the taste of nuts i'm gonna remember to ask about these people i'm going to engage with the game in a different way beginning middle and end of a task i can think about it and i can break it down if i'm running a heist or a caper or anything like that the planning uh, before the heist is something that's hard to get a D&D. &D. And, and I'm going to sort of slam on one of my favorite games, Dungeons & Dragons, because of the, the D20 mechanism. It's just so uh, absolutely awful of a, of a role-playing paradigm um, that it, it takes agency away from the players. It's, it's an awful 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 system for a lot of things um, especially outside of con combat and it drives people away from some of the real meaty stuff which is asking those questions and exploring those uh, those worlds so uh, what you do is you encourage people into the game by offering them something in the before uh, an opportunity to really change things and especially if and don't do this artificially but if they start losing a lot of middles right they go oh I keep doing tasks and we keep failing and then you make it interesting because you've got a, an interesting after what comes next you've actually thought about 
how to reward both success and failure. You need to reward both because you want your players playing the game. You're going to reward their successes and reward their failures. Yes, you reward both. And uh, so you don't just give them treasure. There's things in the treasure. Well, what is in the treasure? Well, you guessed it. It's a person, a secret, or a tool. Of those things, if I can get you thinking of these three things, the before, middle, and after, which includes uh, start, be uh, middle, and finish, if I can get you thinking of those three things, and then get you thinking about a uh, person, a secret, and a tool, that's another group of three. And the last group of three is the intellectual, the mechanical trick for the gamer person, the story clue, the clue to the story to solving the adventure, to stopping the end of the world for the umpteenth time, and then the emotional, the role-playing payoff for uh, people who are about that visceral experience that they're having, make it uh, dripping with, with life and gravitas and interesting things. And when you start doing this, when you start saying that I'm going to give people all these three things, these th three types of things, and you're saying, yeah, Rich, it's nine, and I'm just saying it's three threes. I get it. There are three groups of three makes nine things. But it all comes down to um, making sure you don't ever deal with one thing. I always want to split it into three parts. That's why D&D um, &D was sm smart went back when they had the, the three types of, uh, of saving throws. The six is fine. Um, but uh, the, the three types of saving throws, the three ways to victory, um, the, uh, it, you know, breaking things into threes is really nice. It's really organic. I use the rule of three in magic. I use it throughout uh, beyond the role-playing game. But as a general paradigm for the moderator, for the game master or the dungeon master, whatever your system calls things, I want you to think about never doing a single thing, a single pass-fail roll. Think about how can I break it into three? No, just mindlessly break it into three. Break it into three and go, how can I make these three parts feel just a little bit different? And where am I going to add the little bits of spice and say, hey, can I give you a uh, something a mechanical choice? Say, okay, you can play aggressively or you can play uh, conservatively in the different spots. So you've got a mechanical choice. Now players are starting to be accountable for, the, for their victories and they can... Uh, the, the game people will latch onto those mechanical choices and they're going to do an assessment of probabilities and then they're going to feel good about their gaming things. The role players are going to latch onto those emotional things that you throw out and they're going to feel good about their way of playing the game. And finally, the people who are listening to the story in the world, they're trying to solve the adventure and they're going to recognize, hey, we've heard that name before or this thing is oddly related or oh, wait a second you see the chess piece there's something in the way that it's carved wait a second this is carved the exact same way as some puzzle somewhere and then you've now got all your different ways of coming up with a hook and so you're not thinking about just having them roll the dice and get a success or a fail because that adrenaline that endorphin that rush is going to happen for them regardless now let me go back to a, to a caper i set up for a game of dungeons and dragons with some longtime friends of mine i'd set up a scenario where they're sort of in a pirate-ish campaign it's a nautical adventure on the purple seas and they were short crew members and uh, they couldn't get their boat afloating um, with the crew members they had so what they needed to do is they needed to get some uh, able-bodied seamen as soon as possible 
And one of the things that came up is that there was a group of athletes, uh, some athletes from a town over that had traveled for an or game of or ball. And after the game of or ball, there was a uh, bit of a brawl. Some people were injured. One person uh, died and there was a fire. And the kids are being blamed. So they're being held in the town jail and who knows what's going to happen to them. So their first mate suggested that if they could get those kids out of jail, they could use them on their boat. They'd be happy for the freedom. And then it also laid out um, that coming from another town was a... Um, uh, was a lawyer or barrister to uh, intercede on behalf of the children and some of these ch I say children they're young adults and are ready, you know uh, 16 years old and strong and fit and ready for ready for adventures on the high seas some of them their parents come from money some of them it didn't so there's all kinds of things that they could leverage now my players uh, looked at all of that and they just went straight for the prison they didn't use the setup. They did not take the bait on any of the things that I laid out. And I thought to myself, as this was happening, did I set it up incorrectly? There were a lot of rewards for them. You know, they get a lot of payoffs if they'd gone and intercepted the lawyer and maybe they could have uh, pretended to be the lawyer for the children or they could have gathered more information or they could... Do but they went straight for the thing, which you have to understand what that means. They were interested in getting the, uh, in recruiting some people, getting on the boat and getting on with the adventure. So you go with it. You're not going to punish your players for not taking all the things that you put down. Sometimes you're going to have, uh, you're going to have a buffet of a hundred things and the players are going to take five and move on. And as long as you're remembering to inject those pieces for them to pick up, they can pick them up later. They can pick them up at their convenience. And you'll also begin to get a sense of who your players are. Uh, how often, if I if I drop a mechanical thing, how often are they picking up on those? If I drop a tool, if I drop a role play, what are the things that they pick up? And you can do more of those things. And sometimes what you can do is if you want to shift them into some other things and have them feel good about what they're doing, then um, just make some of them more obvious and give more reward. Um, and that's the real key, is it's the job of the moderator, uh, the dungeon master, to constantly be giving the players reinforcements for successes and failures and to have them plotted out. So at the beginning of any task that you're ever going to ask your players to do, think about what sets it up. What do you want to include in the setup? What do you want to have happen in the middle? What surprises might there be? And then in the end, link your treasure. It's the same thing. Find something in the end, in the after, that's actually interesting. Have the result be what they wanted, but not 100% what they expected. Give them something new. Give them a challenge. And this is what I'm saying it links in. Because the end of one, if you're careful, is actually the beginning for three other things. And there goes my rule of three. Every ending should have three beginnings, right? So that's what you sort of always want to present. Always present. Never present a path. Now, if you present ten options, you're going to overload your players. Every ending has three beginnings, okay? And then it goes from the beginning. You have the beginning parts. You have some options. You have how it happens in the middle. And then you have an ending. And it's got three beginnings from there. So the rule of three. No single roles. A beginning, middle, and end role. So that... They can build their successes and then move forward. So, 
I hope that's helpful for you. I hope you enjoy um, this type of content and I'll catch you next time. Till then, stay safe and it's been fun.